One way to determine how well a line of fit models the data is to analyze this thing called a residual. And a residual is the difference between the y value of the data point and the y value of the corresponding point on the line of best fit. So you can take any set of points and make a line go through them. It's just a question of how good is that line and how much does that line actually represent your data. Now the best lines of fit are going to have some data points above the line and some data points equally below the line. So it's nicely spaced between the points. And obviously ideal is to have some points actually on the line. A way that you can check with residuals is if your residuals are, have an average of zero. So if they're randomly dispersed around the point and some of them are actually on the line, then your residual, which is your, the, the difference between the y values, should be close to zero. So in example one, we've got this set of points or set of data, and we are given this equation negative 2x plus 20, and we want to know does that equation model the data very good or is there another line that would be better? So I've set up the x value and the y value from the table in here, and then the next column says y value of the model. Now remember, the model is y equals negative 2x plus 20. So what we want to do is we want to just calculate what would the y value be if the x value is given in the table. So for example, if the x value is 1, that would give me a y value of 18. If the x value is 2, that would give me a y value of 16, etc. So fill in the column on your own, please. So now the residual is the difference between the actual y value and what it is on the line. So this y value would be 1 because it's 1 higher. This residual is going to be negative 1 because this point is actually 1 lower than where it would be. It should be at 16, but it's actually at 15, which is not necessarily a bad thing. This next residual is going to be negative 1 because it's at 13 and the line puts it at 14. This residual is also negative 1. Then I've got a 0 and a 0 and a 1 and a 1. So they're mostly centered around 0, so that's a good thing. And if you wanted to graph the residuals, you could see that they're all going to be centered around the x-axis. So I'm going to graph this column right here, the x value, and the residual value. So when my x value is 1, my residual is 1. When the x value is 2, my residual is negative 1. x value of 3. x value of 4. 5 and 6 both gave me a 0. And 7 and 8 both gave me a 1. So the good thing about this is that they're mostly centered and they're actually evenly distributed. There are three on the bottom and three on the top and two on the line itself. And so that tells you that this line is a wonderful representation of this data because it's equally spaced um, between all the points. Why don't you try letter B on your own? So I've given you the chart. And I've given you the formula that the person made based on this chart. And I want you to figure out whether this formula is a good line for these data points. So I've made my residuals. I plotted the residuals. And they're certainly not centered around 0. Some of them are very high. Some of them are very low. Um, None of them are zero, um, so this certainly is not. Which means either the line is bad or a line is not the type of um, model that I want to use. Maybe a parabola um, models this information better. Maybe an exponential graph models this data. Oh, you know what? I realized we never wrote that the last one was a good fit. So go back to that first letter A and write down that it was a good fit. I forgot to write that um, down, down for that one. 
So then we've got this thing called a linear regression on a calculator. And the linear regression tells you how well a line models your data. And there's other types. There's quadratic regressions. There's cubic regressions. There's quartic and exponential regressions. There's lots of different types of regressions. Um, but one that we're going to look at right now is called a linear regression because we're talking about lines of fit. And it's called the line of best fit. So the calculator can actually calculate the best mathematically accurate line that exists um, for the data. And a calculator often uses the letter R, which is called the correlation coefficient. And correlation, as you might see in the word, tells you how related the information is. So if you have zero, then the, uh, the correlation is zero then the data really has no relationship with each other, um, like age and number of pets. If there's a strong positive correlation, then you're going to get a number that the correlation coefficient is very close to 1. And if there's a strong negative correlation, then you're going to get a correlation coefficient that is very close to negative 1. So the scenario is no correlation is when all the dots are all over the place and there's nothing related to each other. That's very weird. Hold on. So I've got all these dots, and they're just randomly spread out. Okay, strong positive correlation is when the dots might not be in a perfect straight line, but they're all going up together. And a strong negative correlation would certainly be in the exact opposite scenario, where they're not making a perfectly straight line, but they're all going down in a relatively linear pattern. So when I see you next, we're obviously going to do example two in class because it has to do with the graphing calculator. Um, but we should, if I got the information correctly, these should be the values that we get in the calculator right here. So we kind of already have the answer. But what we're going to do is I'm going to show you how to get to this feature. It's a statistical setting where we type in all of our x value and our y values into the table, as you can see. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, etc. That's the x values. And then 16, 17, 20, etc. are the y values. And then we press a whole bunch of buttons, and I am not lying when I say a whole bunch of buttons. And it will come up with the perfect line. Now, it has y equals ax plus b. And I don't know why they don't use m for the slope, but they use a and b. So they're telling me that the slope of this line is 1.5 and the intercept is 16.3, blah, blah, blah. Very, very precise measurement because the calculator is using all of these values to get it. So like I said, we'll, we'll do this when I see you in class. But there's one more thing I want to talk about, and that's called causation. When a change in one variable results in a change in the other, then it's called a causation. Now, you, a causation creates a correlation, but because just because things are correlated doesn't mean that it's a causation. For example, let's look at example three. Tell whether a correlation is likely. If so, tell whether there is a causal relationship. That's how you read that. It's not. Sometimes I have kids read it as a casual relationship. It's a causal relationship. And we have to explain. So, is there a correlation between the time that you spend exercising and the number of calories that you burn? Are they related? Is there a correlation? So, would there be a negative correlation, a positive correlation, or no correlation? Well, I hope that you would say that there's a positive correlation because the more time you spend exercising, obviously the more calories you're going to burn. Now, is there a causal relationship? Does the more time you spend exercising cause you to burn more calories? And the answer is yes. There's also a positive causation relationship. Because exercising more causes calories to burn. And now we've got the number of banks and the population. So in places where there's a large number of banks, is the population very high? Is the 
when the population is high, do you see a lot of banks? Well, typically, they would make banks to, um, you know, supply enough banks for the population. So there is a positive correlation because obviously they, the bank managers and the banking corporations don't want long lines. So there is a positive correlation, right? Like if you have more banks, then that would make sense that you would have more people in your town. But does making more banks automatically cause the population to go up? Like if I say to myself, I want to make the population in Metapoiset increase, is my choice going to be, you know what would do that? Building another bank. Would building another bank make the population go up? And it wouldn't. There's not a causal relationship. And causation and correlation are a little confusing when you're thinking about them. You have to just pause for a second and think, is one thing going to force the other to happen? But creating a bank is not going to force the population to go up. Unlike in letter A, where... In, an increase in my exercising will cause me to burn more calories. It will force those calories to be burned. So that's why there was a causal relationship in A, but no causal relationship in letter B. Just one more thing I want to add is that causation can only happen when a correlation exists. So if there's no correlation, meaning if the two things are not even related, then obviously one thing is not going to cause the other. So don't look for causation if the answer to correlation is none. However, just because there's a correlation doesn't mean that there's a causation like in example B. So that's what this statement is saying. Correlation does not always imply causation, but causation can't exist without correlation. And if you have any questions, write them down and ask me when you come to class.